and you can bet it's not work, and you can turn that table out. You need to connect an HDMI cable and go out of the Mac computer or the other one, and then send that, uh, and then uh, play the video directly in uh, from there. What? All right, so look, here's the deal.
Monday, August 23rd, 2021. Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, broadcasting live from Los Angeles. River Jesse Jackson Sr. and his wife Jacqueline, they have been hospitalized due to COVID. We'll give the latest uh, on their condition. Uh, we continue to track how devastating COVID-19, the Delta variant, is across the country. Why are so many officials, frankly, being stuck on stupid and fighting mask mandates? In fact, the Louisiana Attorney General is under fire because he was giving advice on how parents could skirt these various mask mandates. That showed you how crazy these people are. Also, the AFL-CIO, they have elected the first woman president in their 60-year history. Also, President Joe Biden is considering ex extending U.S. troop deployments in Afghanistan to, fa to facilitate the evacuation of Americans out of that country. Also, we say goodbye to the civil rights legend uh, and the inspiration for the Montgomery bus boycotts, Lucille Times. She passed away at the age of 100. Also, Hades government says some 600,000 people are in need, and we have the latest on the developments in the R. Kelly trial. It is time to bring the funk. I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the find. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. All right, folks, Roland Martin here, broadcasting live from Los Angeles, California. Uh, COVID continues to dominate the storyline all across the country uh, as we see seeing more people being diagnosed and impacted by the Delta variant. Uh, the FDA, they have finally given a full approval uh, to the Pfizer COVID drug. And so now it has um, a full, uh, so now it's going to allow them to actually be able to distribute this uh, all across the country. We continue, as I say, uh, to deal with this issue. Over the weekend, we found out that Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr. and his wife, Jacqueline Jackson, both hospitalized due to COVID. Let's talk about where we are right now with Dr. Tyson Bale. Of course, he is the uh, critical care and infectious disease expert at the University of Virginia. He joins us. Glad, always glad to have you on the show. Uh, Doc, uh, what is interesting here is that we are, we are seeing this Delta variant. We keep having experts on trying to explain to people what's going on here, that when people don't get vaccinated, then they get COVID. The virus is mutating and becoming a deadlier virus. Could you please explain to folks what that means? Uh, thanks for having me on, Roland. And, uh, you know, sadly, you're exactly right. Um, each time the virus infects someone else, it's like playing the lottery. And just like playing the lottery, um, if you play the lottery once, probably not going to win. But if you have a whole lot of tickets, there's a greater chance that you'll have uh, a breakthrough. So just like um, with uh, the lottery, the COVID-19 virus, if there's a lot of it circulating in the country and across the world, it has more lottery tickets and it has that chance to find that variant that's going to cause more problems. So in the case of the Delta variant, this one emerged in India in a country that had a very low vaccination rate. It just exploded throughout the country as we saw. Delta variant emerged and now it's over here. And so, of course, we're at risk now of having further variants. And that really just reemphasizes the point that we absolutely have to get more people vaccinated, decrease the chances that the, vac that the virus will continue to spread throughout the country. And that's how we finally turn the tide on the pandemic. So the news today of the FDA fully approving the Pfizer vaccine, that's welcome news. And I hope that we can use it to get even more people vaccinated. So, Doc, you're saying that the more people who are vaccinated, it decreases the chances of new variants being developed, right? Exactly. 100 percent. So it's, one I, of the I things wish, that I uh, I could, it, we're seeing, we talk say, about, but it's, it's just that simple. We got to get more people vaccinated. Um, you, you Obviously, you have hesitancy. Um, there are 
all kinds of different people who are throwing stuff out here, and they 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 they, they again say all kind of stuff. You got all of these uh, these all of a sudden these new Google physicians, uh, folks who never went to medical school, uh, offering their advice and counsel and had no idea what they're talking about. I also believe there was a, there was a TikTok video that I played over the weekend that's on my page uh, that I actually uh, ran where there was an actual scientist who was responding to some woman on TikTok who was kind of like, no, nope, that's not true. Uh, that's a lie. Nope, you're wrong. I think there has to be more of that. I think there has to be a direct attack a direct assault on taking those videos and saying, no, no, this is the truth and exposing these people or their lies. Otherwise, look, last week, Facebook announced that one of their top posts on Facebook was an, was an anti-vaccine article that was riddled with just numerous errors. That's what we're seeing being disseminated across the country. And our audience is being fed this stuff and they're buying into it. I think you're completely right. We have to really start aggressively calling this information out. At this point, um, the COVID-19 is own, it's, it's its own pandemic. It's, it's bad enough, but the misinformation is a pandemic in and of itself. And it spreads at a much more rapid rate than factual information from credible experts. And I've seen it myself. We've had people come into the hospital where I work, um, intubated, who are believing that this is a hoax, even up to the point where the breathing tube goes down. They're getting fed information from false sources saying that the vaccines either don't work, they're not necessary, and they're not effective, and they're not safe. All of which we know are not true. The vaccines are safe. They are effective. It can keep you out of the hospital. It can keep you from dying from COVID-19. And so we have to be very aggressive now about calling out governors who are not doing the right thing and, and are not promoting things like uh, masks and the mitigation measures, not promoting vaccines. Uh, we really have to do as much as we can and start getting aggressive about calling, uh, calling the, the BS out. Well, uh, look, I mean, I, I, again, the, one of the reasons why we keep uh, putting experts on, I keep trying to tell people, uh, look, w we particularly want to have black experts on because you need to hear exactly what's going on. We talk about this Pfizer, uh, this full approval. What does that mean for the Food and Drug Administration? What does it mean for the public? Well, it means a few things. So, uh, so first of all, this is not any surprise at all. I mean, there's never been a vaccine or drug in history that has as much data supporting its approval than the COVID-19 vaccine, Pfizer vaccine, a lump Moderna in with that. We're talking about 300 million doses given here in the U.S. with a robust uh, efficacy and safety profile. So these are legit. It was legit yesterday just as much as, as they are legit today. But what the full approval does is allow employers uh, to require the vaccination. So you saw just hours after the news being released, the U.S. military saying that it's going to require it for its troops, for their safety and the safety of, of those in their communities. My own hospital released a policy to fully uh, to require full vaccination in colleges and universities. This might be that step that a lot of, uh, of employers were waiting for to really require and, be in, uh, and get people vaccinated. Now, I do think there may be some people who are waiting for that full stamp of approval. Um, I don't think that's going to be a, a large population move the needle. But when we see employers start to require this, I think that, that's hopefully when we'll see an uptick um, in um, people getting vaccinated. Oh, there's no doubt. I, I think uh, that is really what is what the game changer by having companies say, you want your job, you got to get vaccinated because nobody wants to uh, lose their job. And of course, you have the few people out there, including the people who work at hospitals who are upset by it. And they're saying tough, but we're not going to sit here and continue to uh, and infect people. This is where we are. And the reason we keep we keep harping on these variants, because you and other doctors are saying that newer variants can be even deadlier than the, the Delta variant. That says a lot. Yeah, that's really what worries me. We have three quarters of the worldwide population is not vaccinated at this point. We've got the entire continent of Africa with just 2% fully vaccinated, which is just an embarrassing uh, statistic. And so when we have these areas that have densely populated cities that have uh, poor healthcare infrastructure in some cases, they are just a setup to putting us back to square one with another variant that may emerge in these areas. And so we don't really want it. We don't want to get back to square one. So we have to take care of uh, our people at home, of course, and expand vaccination. Uh, but we also have to make sure that we're getting vaccine supply into the world uh, so that we can decrease the chance that we'll have this again. 
Um, one of the things that uh, we, we have been g g looking over and we talk about these uh, these particular numbers uh, th that we're seeing, first of all, uh, the FDA approval of the Pfizer vaccine is for those 16 and older. Uh, what do you do? You know what the status is? Then that's Pfizer. What about Moderna? What about uh, you also have the Johnson and Johnson? Right. So I expect Moderna to fold. Yeah, they've already filed for full FDA approval. I expect that to happen in the next few months or so. Johnson & Johnson will be behind them as well. So uh, we can expect, let's say, um, early to midwinter is, is kind of the timeline that um, that we've been given so far. And now another big question are children. So uh, children below the age of 12 uh, currently have no vaccination option. The trials are concluding at this point. And, um, and the officials at the FDA have indicated that we can expect to see some results around mid-fall to late fall. So hopefully we can start vaccinating. That first group will most likely be kids 5 to 11. Um, and then and, uh, hopefully we can get emergency use authorization in that group. Uh, now, one thing I want to mention, uh, you know, another possibility uh, with full, uh, full approval for the FDA is that you can have off-label use of drugs and vaccines. Doctors do it all the time. And so I've gotten a lot of questions from parents who've asked me, you know, I've got a young child who's not eligible for vaccination. Um, if these vaccines are fully approved, could my pediatrician use it as an off-label use for my child? And what I would say to that is now the doses are different for the for the for the Pfizer vaccine in children. It's about a third of the regular dose for adults because you don't need that much for children. And so at this point, I wouldn't recommend um, having children given off-label use of the FDA Pfizer vaccine. I just say that because I've gotten this question from a few people so far, but we want to make sure that the right dose is given to children and that we can make sure that they're protected. And in the meantime, the way you protect children, make sure the adults around them are vaccinated, make sure you're doing public health mitigation measures, wearing a mask, especially indoors. This is how we really protect children in the midst of a surge. I, I got to ask you about this here. The FDA actually posted this on their Twitter feed on yesterday. This is just stunning. You are not a horse. You are not a cow. Y'all go to my iPad, please. You are not a horse. You're not a cow. Seriously, y'all, stop it. These folks are taking this anti-parasitic drug meant for livestock. I don't understand. You are afraid of a free vaccine, but you're so dumb that you're taking a drug for horses? I saw this tweet and I had no words for it. Um, but uh, I also saw that the Mississippi Department of Public Health Poison Control Center, I've seen a spike in uh, calls to the center for people having ivermectin overdose. Now, this is one of these therapies that we looked at earlier on in the course of the pandemic. Um, it has no use whatsoever in the treatment of COVID-19. That's been proven in our high quality trials. But th this just feeds into how dangerous this, this disinformation can be. This is on the level of the president, the prior president saying, uh, why, why don't we inject bleach? Um, you cannot, when you feed this information, people will die. People will get sick. Uh, people will not get vaccinated. They will not uh, listen to public health mitigation measures. They're going to do these stupid things like go to a livestock feed supply and get a drug that's not approved that treats worms in animals because someone told them that it was effective for COVID-19. Uh, so it, it was sad to see. I, I had to, to double check, um, uh, you know, check and make sure that this was actually happening. Unfortunately, it is. Uh, but it just goes to show just how dangerous misinformation can be. All right, Dr. Tyson Bell, we surely appreciate it, man. Thank you so very much. Thank you for having me. All right, folks, I want to go to uh, bring in my uh, panel right now. Uh, joining us uh, on uh, today's show, uh, certainly glad to have them in the house, Dr. Avis jones Weaver, political analyst, Dr. Julian Melvo, econom e economist, president of the mayor. Uh, so I don't have Julian, sorry, and Torun Walker, founder of Context Media. Uh, I, I got to ask y'all this one because uh, this is really confusing to me. Uh, it, it really is. Uh, and that is when when I look at this, um, when I look at these numbers and you look at these uh, the, these states uh, that are the best states in terms of uh, positive rate, lowest rates. And so uh, highest vaccination rates among states, Vermont, Hawaii, Massachusetts, Connecticut and New Jersey. They're the highest vaccine rates. The lowest positive rates of COVID, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, Vermont, and Maine. Then, of course, we have uh, low hospitalizations, 
Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, and North Dakota. Then you have the lowest death rates, Vermont, California, Connecticut, Wisconsin, and Washington, D.C. reported the lowest death rates. But the worst states for COVID, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, Kentucky, Texas, and Alabama, they have the most unvaccinated residents, hospitalizations, and death. What do these states have in common? They are red states run by Republicans. That is crazy, Avis. Mm. It, it. Avis, uh, I can't Sorry hear about that. Can you hear me now? There you go. There you, there go. you go. Perfect. Uh, yes. It is ridiculous. And I have to say I'm a bit shocked that no one uh, has yet sued uh, any of the governors of the state in some way, for having these ridiculous um, per, uh, these ridiculous rules in place in which they are literally penalizing people, penalizing people for taking the actions that are necessary to protect themselves. And who are they hurting? They're hurting their own constituency. That's what's so crazy about it. You know, when this thing first started, it was seem to be largely concentrated in highly uh, populated, very dense urban areas, right, where the first places pretty much that were hit. And so you had the Republicans who felt like most of their constituency was in more rural areas or more spread out areas that were sort of uh, sort of pushing this uh, mythology around uh, COVID, which would they, sort of the anti-masking anti and everything that has now sort of morphed also into the anti-vaxxing. Now that we've gotten to a situation where their constituency in particular has fully bought into this and are now literally dying of disproportionately results, now they're trying to pull it back, even to where Trump himself tried to, you know, say that he was vaccinated, got booed on stage for saying it. The bottom line is this. Uh, they have injected this poison not only uh, in the country at large, but specifically and disproportionately within their own supporters. Uh, and now that they're trying to put the genie back in the bottle, at least some of them are, uh, they're find it, finding it very difficult, if not impossible, to do so. To run? You know, um, it's really fascinating to me because I don't think I've ever seen a situation in American history where politicians that represent a constituency are actively trying to kill their constituents and trying to destroy the lives of the people they say they represent. I think there's a couple of things that are going on with this, though. I think some of this is classic um, regional stubbornness, where you have a people, you have people who are so against being uh, dictated to in their minds by the federal government that they're willing to injure themselves and physically kill their. Um, kill the people in their um, in their states because they don't want to feel like the government is telling them what to do. That's one part of it. The other part of it is, like the doctor said, there is an extreme campaign of misinformation that's happening in the South. There is a lack of education when it comes to um, health care, just in general, even before COVID happened. And there's a lack of outreach to rural areas and people in the Deep South about how to protect themselves and how to take care of themselves. So it's just, I think it's a confluence of People who don't want to be told what to do in their minds because they feel like anything that's going to dictate to them, even if it's for their own good, is going to be against their freedoms, quote unquote. You have a combination of um, elected officials who feel like they want to stick it to the federal government. And then you have this long history of misinformation and neglect of Southern health issues. So there's a lot of things going on and it's all dangerous. Well, look at this idiot the attorney general in Louisiana who's actually telling parents how to bypass man mask mandates. Jeff Landry uh, posted sample letters to his office's Facebook page using philosophical or religious ex explanations as reasons for a parent to get their child a mask exception in a Louisiana school. It came one day after Louisiana Governor John Bell Edwards reinstated the mask mandate for people over five. Now, currently, uh, cases in the state are surging. Uh, the 649,000 cases in Louisiana, more than 11,000 have died from the virus. But to post that on his personal page, and here's the deal, the Catholic Church has made it perfectly clear they're not going to be offering religious exemptions for people trying to use their Catholicism as a reason not to get the vaccine. 
It is unbelievable. Unbelievable. And what's really sad is that these poor children really have no say in the matter. They are relying on their parents. Um, to protect them and to look out for their best interest. And unfortunately, a large proportion of them likely have very idiotic parents. The challenge is that those children aren't segregated from the other children. And masks are most effective when you have universal adaptation of that. You know, if you are sending your child to a school masked, but they're in a classroom with a large proportion of their classmates who are unmasked, uh, you're, you're not really putting your child in a safe environment. And so those families who are trying to do the right thing, are trying to protect their children, they themselves are now being put at a disadvantage that puts their children's lives in danger and their lives in danger. The bottom line is that the Delta variant is different from the original version of COVID, which we know disproportionately impacted, of course, the oldest Americans. And now we're seeing that younger people are being disproportionately impacted as compared to the first version of this virus. And we're even seeing that children are being negatively impacted and ended up in uh, ICUs. And so the fact that you have adults who claim to be leaders literally putting out cult-like information that is, is this today's version of making people drink the spiked Kool-Aid. They're like modern-day Jim Joneses trying to murder their own followers. I just don't understand why this idiocracy continues to be dominant within the Republican Party to a point where they're killing their own constituency and just don't seem to give a damn about it. Folks, like uh, this uh, is impacting. Sorry, uh, sorry, uh, Tehran, go ahead. I was just going to say that um, I, I, I want to know what's really behind this, because there's no logical explanation for elected officials in these states to move the way they are. I want to know what's behind this, what's driving this, and I want to know who's getting paid for this, because this just absolutely makes absolutely no sense. I mean, there's no logical political um, gain you can get from this. There's no political party in power. It's like their leader, Trump, is no longer in power. So they're not going to get any kind of feedback from that. You're not going to get any um, any kind of benefit from that. So I don't understand why these people are so adamant about putting so many of the people who are in their states who they claim to say they represent at risk. I don't get it. I get it. Uh, it's because the hardcore right is filled with crazy, demented people. Uh, who believe in this, our liberties are being taken, this is so grossly unfair, that's what's driving it. But the bottom line is uh, it's idiotic, and folks like Landry should be booted out of office. COVID is impacting so many of us folks. Uh, many were shocked to find to hear the news. Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr., as well as his wife Jacqueline, were hospitalized in Chicago over the weekend with COVID. They remain in the hospital. They've been treated at Northwestern Memorial Hospital in Chicago, and Reverend Jackson was va vaccinated in January, we have not uh, had confirmation that Mrs. Jackson was vaccinated. And doctors report the couple is responding well to treatment and both are, both are resting uh, comfortably. Um, this, is, uh, this was distressing to a lot of people for a lot of reasons. Um, uh, Avis, uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr. is 79 years old. His wife Jacqueline is 77 years old. Uh, that was one of the first thoughts that came to my mind. Um, you know, I am. I was at least relieved to hear that at least we know that Reverend Jackson has had his vaccine, and so hopefully that will reduce uh, his chance of um, actually succumbing to this virus. Uh, we hope that his wife also is vaccinated. But the bottom line is he does have uh, his advanced age against him, working against him in this situation. So we, do, we certainly hope that uh, both uh, recover from this uh, and are able to move forward uh, in their lives for many, many, many years uh, after their bout with COVID. We're definitely hoping and praying that they recover fully. Uh, to run, it's uh, certainly uh, something that we uh, uh, are all praying for and, and hopefully uh, things uh, turn out well for both Reverend Jackson and Mrs. Jackson. Absolutely. And there's another um, factor at play here as well. Um, we know that uh, Reverend Jackson was dealing with some other health issues, which COVID definitely would not help. Parkinson's. And yep. It's, mm -hmm, yeah. And it's good that um, he's on the he's on the man, him and his wife. The other part of this, too, is 
we have a whole generation of uh, civil rights icons and civil rights leaders who are aging. And they are also, um, some of them have left. Like in the past couple of years, we've seen C.T. Vivian, um, John Lewis, other people um, who have passed away just very recently. And I think we have to have a conversation as well, even outside of their illness, is the fact that who's going to be taking their place and where is that knowledge, where is that information going to go when these people eventually pass on? I think that's something that we have to consider as well. Who are they grooming? All right, folks, uh, let's uh, now go to New York, where day four of the R. Kelly trial uh, took place today with explosive testimony from a woman who claims uh, that she was sexually abused by R. Kelly when she was 17 years old. This is, again, day four of the trial of the R&B singer. Uh, and like last week, testimony had been nothing short of shocking. One of, R one of Kelly's former girlfriends, Asriel Clary, testified the singer knowingly passed on a sexually transmitted disease to her, adding the artist promised fame in exchange for sexual favors. However, Kelly's lawyers have labeled the accusers groupies who want to take advantage of his fame and fortune. Now, Kelly is found guilty. He will be uh, sentenced to life in prison. Joining me now to discuss this is Oranique Odelier, o o o o a co-founder of uh, Hashtag Meet R. Kelly. Hope I pronounced that correct. You were pretty close. It's Oranique Odelier. Gotcha. Over Nikkei, Odelaye. Okay, got it. So, over uh, let's, let's talk about what we're seeing now. First off, we're actually seeing, for the first time, women who were sexually assaulted uh, by R. Kelly when they were underage. That is not what we experienced in his first trial when he was acquitted in Chicago. Yeah, I think um, now, you know, with all of the progress that we've made as a society, as a culture, and as a community, women now feel safer and more emboldened to show their face um, and, and stay in front of the world what happened to them. Um, I think back during his first trial, uh, we weren't in a place where those young women and their families felt that they could do that and be safe um, and move forward from it with their lives, um, and so made choices to not come forward. Uh, but now, luckily, um, you know, we're, we're, we're in a different space. And so these women feel like they can do that. And we're super proud um, and supportive of them uh, because it's really important that they do. This doesn't stop unless we have a space for women to stand up and say what happened to them and speak their truth and be heard and be listened to and their claims be taken seriously. Um, so we're really happy to see this. The... Um this is just one trial. Uh, he also is facing um, um, uh, prosecutors in two other states as well. Uh, it, it is clear uh, that federal prosecutors uh, are clearly, clearly um, looking at R. Kelly and want to make sure that he does not have another free day in this society. Yeah, I mean, this evidence has been out here in the public for decades at this point. I mean, we all had it, you know. DeAndre mm -hmm. on the block had this evidence. Um, you know, we, we all have seen, heard, know someone who has experienced um, R. Kelly's perversity and his crimes against these young women. Um, so none of this is really, really new. I think at this point, um, you know, they really are gathering up all of the, the cords of, of um, history that's out there to really, really throw the book at him. But it's so long overdue. We knew what was happening literally 30 years ago. It's taken that long for us to get to the point where prosecutors want to take these women seriously, the community is taking these women seriously, and people feel like that, you know, enough is enough. Um, I don't know why it's taken us this long, because we really didn't need all of the carts and carts and carts of evidence that they, they brought in on the first day of trial, we knew from the videotape forever ago what this man was doing to young women. Um, so, you know, I mean, he I, I can't see how he can maneuver out of this, but stranger things have happened, so we're keeping a close eye on it. The thing here that um, I, I think is, is really, really uh, in, important as well is that the crumbling of the infrastructure around R. Kelly, some would say, because the money ran out. Uh, prosecutors have been helped because the, the women, again, like uh, uh, Asriel, one of the women who was fiercely defending him, they actually then began to turn on him. So now you have first-hand accounts from people who were inside of uh, R. Kelly's circles now testifying against him. 
Yeah, a big part of that absolutely is the money running out, which is why Meet R. Kelly was a call for a financial boycott of the singer. We've known forever that it was the money that insulated him from the consequences of his crime. It was the money that allowed him to pay off families. It was the money that allowed him to pay off victims. It was the money that allowed the record companies to um, feel that they needed to continue to hide what he was doing and clean up after him. It was the money that was hiring the bodyguards that were, were guarding these women. You know, I mean, it's always been the money that has kept him from consequences. Um, and so we called for people to stop financially supporting him so that that wall could come down between him and justice. Um, and when the money goes, people are less inclined to hide your secrets. They're less inclined to, you know, try to uh, take up for you out here because they have no longer, they no longer have a financial incentive. So you're seeing, you know, managers and road managers and, and people who work with him now will come forward because he's no longer the cash cow. Um, and so now they've got to think about saving their own butts and they're going to, you know, spill the beans in court to do that. Um, I want to pull in uh, Toron and uh, Avis as well. I mean, th this is, is, is to the point that Oranike makes there, uh, uh, Avis, it was absolutely vital to go after the money. The reality is there were stations that continued to play his music. Uh, there were individuals that continued to uh, to, to to book him. Uh, I remember when he was on the Tom Jonah Morning Show cruise, uh, and it was very. I mean, I remember being at that cruise, going, "Are Kelly's performing? Really? <laughs> who proved that?" Um, and there were a lot of people who, again, who, who made excuses uh, because the reality is, R. Kelly was still a hit maker. That's exactly right. I mean, you know, this is no secret. Absolutely correct to say uh, that uh, his abusive behavior has been known literally for decades. Uh, and there has been several, like, investigative reports. You know, you, you would have to have your head in the sand not to know what was going on with R. Kelly and what had been going on on with R. Kelly since the days of Aaliyah, okay? And so it, it, what it has shown to me, though, uh, when, when I think about it over the years, because I was one of the people, even in those times, like you, asking in a variety of dis dis situations, we still giving this man legitimacy? I, what does that say about how much we value, or shall I say devalue, black girls? You know, if he was targeting uh, white girls in the way that he was a serial abuser to black girls, would he would have had all of these decades of freedom? And why is it that the black community for so many years seemed to give him a pass? Because they kind of like the music that he was coming out with. It, it, is, it is both the money, but it's also, for some reason, a community response that still seem to, on the one hand, still reward him by still going to his concerts, by still buying his music, by still sort of shaking their butts to his latest hit, uh, and at the same time making excuses, as well as blaming, victim blaming, uh, the young women that he himself were targeting, going to, going to schools, getting girls leaving school. You know, come on now. We've known this for decades. So I would just, you know, I would just have to say it is about time that the chickens came home to roost. Yes, I agree that the money needed to be uh, sort of uh, cut off in order for people to come out of the woodworks who had been protecting him in the past because they knew that they were getting some money on the back end. But it's unfortunate that the money had to be come off for people to finally uh, live up to some sense of morality. Haran, uh, it was the pressure uh, led by uh, a number of black women that created the critical mass to get to the point we're at with this trial uh, in uh, Brooklyn. Well, you know, um, there's a saying that people's morality only goes as far as their pocketbook. And I think it's ex I think it's a wonderful thing that What's what you're seeing with the situation with R. Kelly's finally coming to pass and you're starting to see some things come to fruition. But something I want to um, point out is that even though what R. Kelly's accused of and these crimes are disgusting, 
he's just one example of something that's very prevalent in entertainment. Um, the entertainment business can be a very ugly place. It can be a very, very predatorial place. It can be very dangerous for um, women, especially black women, and for men to that, to that, to a degree. But because so many people who are so guilty of a lot of these crimes are insulated, like the um, other two ladies said, by um, power structures and by record labels and by um, a whole infrastructure that basically shields them from any responsibility for, for the things they do, that it's very rare for a situation like this to get to this point. I think what happened with Harvey Weinstein kind of like opened a lot of doors and it kind of knocked down some walls about like what you can do and how far power can go in the entertainment business if you are like say a celebrity and you have people who are willing to cover for you. But we live in an age now where a lot of the things that we heard about in the 60s and 70s with like rock bands and like with punk rock bands and even country stars and this sort of thing, you had you didn't have the you didn't have the fast moving infrastructure and the fast moving social media that got these stories out into the public like you do now. So what you're seeing is immediate results, even though in this case it took decades to happen. A lot of these stories don't no longer are hidden in behind the scenes until somebody writes a book 20 to 20 years later. So what you're seeing is a little bit more of a faster response to these things than you would in the past. But make no mistake, R. Kelly is just one example of a very prevalent thing that happens in entertainment. And there's people in the industry who are doing the exact same things, most likely. They're just not known just yet. Renike, a uh, final okay. comment, please. I would absolutely agree. The entertainment industry is is rife with these type of problems. And I think that we always have to remember, at the end of the day, we have more power than the structures that we are supporting. Like, these structures only exist because we put our money um, into them. You know, and record companies can't exist without our streams, without our sales, um, without us going to concerts. And so I think that even if they don't have a financial incentive um, to do the right thing and to impose some level of morality on their artists, we have a responsibility to do that. We have a responsibility to call them out. We have a responsibility to say we're not going to support these artists and we're not going to support your label if you are um, funding abusers, um, rapists, murderers, all, you know, all the kinds of things that the record companies are, are, are willing to overlook for profit. We have to step up and say we're not going to stand for it. Um, I think part of the victory of R. Kelly getting to this point is that it took all of us standing up to all these structures of power and saying, no, actually, we have the power and we have decided enough is enough. And I think we have to continue to do that so that they know the minute they see these type of issues, they got to start pulling some coattails and not let this be a 10, 15, 20, 30 year problem that just goes on and on forever. Um, it's something that they nip in the bud from the jump. Um, I think we have to remember always that we are the ones with the power and we can say that we're not going to stand for it. All right. Well, Renee K., we appreciate it. Thanks so much for all your great work. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, folks. Got to go to a break. But before we do, here's a word from one of our partners, Seek.com. Seek.com is founded by Mary Spio, a sister. It is a virtual reality company uh, where they have content on their site. Again, Seek.com. They also have their products. They have the 360-degree headphones. Uh, these uh, headsets are amazing. Uh, tremendous base. You can all use, them, use these headsets for gaming as well. Plus, they have their virtual reality headsets where you place your cell phone into the device to allow you to see that VR content, but also 360-degree video. If you want to uh, get that headphone, get those headphones or the VR headset, all you got to do is use this promo code, RMVIP21, RMVIP21. Go to Seek.com uh, to get their products. When you support them, you support us because a portion of the proceeds come back to us at Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, got to go to break. When we come back, more from Los Angeles, uh, including, we'll tell you about uh, what's happening in Afghanistan, a sister. 
uh, Lucille Times, 100 years old, uh, civil rights veteran, uh, passes away. We'll tell you uh, exactly uh, what she did and what she's uh, all about. Plus, big changes uh, at the AFL-CL after the unexpected death of their leader, Richard Trump. And we'll tell you who their new president is. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Back in a moment. When you study the music, yeah. you get black history by default. And so no no other craft could carry as many words as rap music. I try to intertwine that and make that create the, whatever I'm supposed to send out to the universe. A rapper, it, you know, for the longest period of time has gone through phases. I love the word. I hate, I hate what it's become, you know, in, in, to this generation, the way they visualize it. It's narrative kind of like has gotten away and spun away from, I guess, the ascension of black people. Football bands and one of the best fan experiences in the country. The Cricket BX Swag Challenge kickoff returns to Atlanta on August 28th along with special guests. College game day. Then Alcorn State takes on North Carolina Central with conference bragging rights on the line. Center Park Stadium is the place to be on August 28th. Come tailgate all day before enjoying a primetime matchup on the gridiron. You don't want to miss this. Check out MeaxWackChallenge.com for more information. And don't forget, we'll be broadcasting Roland Martin Unfiltered from Atlanta Friday and Saturday. Friday, we're from the Brave Stadium. Uh, and so we look forward to talking with the uh, SWAC and MEAC officials. Then on Saturday, we'll be in the Coca-Cola Fan Zone broadcasting from there. Got some great content lined up for you. We'll also be bringing you the halftime show and the concert after the game. So, folks, just check out Roland Martin Unfiltered. And don't forget, the game time at 7 p.m. Eastern on ESPN on Saturday. We look forward to the Swag Meag Challenge, of course. And thanks for our partners, Coca-Cola. ...have lost the ability to focus the, the discipline on the art of organizing. The challenges, there's so many of them, and they're complex. And we need to be moving to address them. But I'm able to say... Watch out, Tiffany. I know this road. That is so freaking dope. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Chrisette Michelle. Hi, I'm Chaley Rose, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Folks, two firsts for the AFL-CIO, their first woman president and the first African-American man as Secretary of Treasurer, Liz Shuler, will lead the nation's largest federation of unions following the uh, death of President Richard Trumka. Shuler plans to focus on growing unions and uplifting women and people of color during her tenure. She already plans to seek re-election in 2022. The AFL-CIO's executive council also elected Fred Redman, a United Steelworkers Union official, as Secretary Treasurer, making him the first African-American to hold the organization's number two office. Uh, to have an African-American the number two in the AFL-CIO, to have, uh, of course, Lee Saunders uh, leading AFSCME, uh, that's uh, pretty significant, Avis. All right, Avis, you're still there? Yes, sorry. Yes, it is pretty significant. Right, so Can you hear me? Yeah, it is pretty significant. So, yeah, go you ahead, know, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so oftentimes, you know, unfortunately, this was a surprise to lose a leader so suddenly. Um, but uh, it is good to see that there are people that were in the wings that were capable of coming in that have, uh, that will bring with them a very diverse standpoint and viewpoint. So it's wonderful to see uh, this organization get its first uh, black woman. It's wonderful to see the secretary, um, quite, um, I'm sorry, woman. And it's wonderful to see uh, a black man as secretary treasurer. So it's great to see people in leadership of the AFL-CIO uh, that in many respects will reflect 
um, many of its uh, members and really look at what they can do for working people moving forward, uh, being individuals that are coming from backgrounds that will allow them to better understand what some of the people they are representing are going through on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And so let's talk about here in California, where a California woman is suing Northern California Police Department after being knocked unconscious during a traffic stop. Nakia Porter and her father were traveling through Northern California uh, when they were they pulled over to switch drivers. Well, a Solano County Sheriff's car happened to be at the exact place where they pulled over. A female deputy approached Porter, explained what they were doing. It wasn't until another deputy walked up that this happened. You know what? The tank car. The tank car. Put your hands on the back of your head. <laughs> Change six stars and third. Put your hands behind your back. Put your hands behind your back. Change six stars and third. Bless me. They are approaching me and putting me on the car with force. So those that are listening, I am not a yes, risk. You have two different plates on your vehicle. Two different plates, but you're yes. pressing on me. You're not really you're not right. listening. You're not listening. Excuse me. What are you doing? Why are you pulling me away from the car? You're going to Now, Porter is accusing the Sheriff's Department of violating state and federal civil rights protections. I'm watching that video, Avis, and I'm confused. Why in the hell is she being arrested? I am confused. She was confused, too. It's like zero communication whatsoever from those officers. They just went straight to, I would argue, violating her. And what's really disturbing is that she had children in the car that are there to witness it. You know, I, I really think that it's important that, uh, you know, people see videos like this to show this woman was not, um, she was not violent. She was not acting aggressively. She was not acting in any way, I would say, you know, irrationally. She was calm the entire time, probably a whole lot more calm than I would have been under those circumstances. She never even raised her voice. And so the, the way in which she was manhandled, manhandled, uh, by those officers without giving any explanation as to why they even put her, their hands on her in the first place is ridiculous. Uh, they need to be held to account. I don't, you know, it makes no sense to me. I'm not an attorney, but I don't understand uh, how a police officer can come and manhandle you in that way, put cuffs on you, take you away from those children. God only knows what happens to the children once she's arrested, and they're never telling her, never telling her what her rights are. They never told her what she was being detained for. That, to me, uh, as a layperson, seems at minimum unconstitutional and even beyond that abusive and assault-like behavior. Uh, let's go to Pennsylvania, where a police chief gets suspended after harassing a pregnant black woman. Homestead Police Chief Jeff Desimone harassed uh, Cam uh, uh, Camelia Stewart in a pharmacy drive through Desimone, who was in plain clothes, began shouting and flashing his police lights from an unmarked car at Stewart, who was getting medication for her sick child. Black Homestead residents complained the chief regularly exhibits uh, this poor behavior and urged him to resign. Desimone calls the incident a little dispute. And his demands to cut the pharmacy line were reasonable due to his position. <laughs> hmm. What? Could it be your white privileged position? <laughs> that is the most ridiculous thing. Okay, so I'm here. I'm the police chief. And I'm just supposed to be able to cut in front of people in line and in the process, harass people who are there legitimate, legitimately getting medication that they need and following the rules and tradition by actually waiting their turn to get it. And, you know, I see that he's suspended for three days for harassment. 
But once again, I don't understand, you know, that's really, to me, not enough. He, his position requires that he's supposed to be someone who protects and serves the public. If you're not doing that, and instead you're going completely to the other end by harassing a pregnant woman, of all people, uh, and that's what we know of now, as you mentioned, I'm sure this is not the only thing that he's done this out of bounds. I don't, you know, it really shows to me how important it, uh, it is that we take advantage of our opportunity to shape who holds these offices. And oftentimes, these police chiefs, they are either, at, it's either an appointed position or an elected position, which once again goes back to the importance of flexing our political power so that we make sure that those people who are in leadership in these types of positions at the state and local level are individuals who are not abusive once they get a little bit of power in their hands and go power tripping in the same way it seems like this police officer did at this moment. Uh, absolutely. All right, let's talk about Haiti, where the death toll there arises as gang leaders offers to help relief efforts. Last week, it was Haiti was battered uh, by... Of course, severe storms. Now gangs are complicating relief efforts after stealing much-needed resources from rescue workers and causing havoc across the island. Today, one of Haiti's biggest gang leaders says a truce is in place and hopefully the recovery process can continue. More than 60,000 buildings were left destroyed or seriously damaged from the August 14th 7.2 magnitude earthquake. Haiti's Civil Protection Agency says more than 2,200 people are dead. 344 people are still missing, more than 12,000 folks injured, and nearly 50, 53,000 houses were destroyed uh, by the earthquake. Uh, in Afghanistan, the process to evacuate American citizens from Afghanistan continues. American officials uh, don't have the exact count of how many people are uh, left uh, there, but they estimate between 10 and 15,000. The Pentagon reports 42,000 people have been relocated since July. President Biden is confident that the United States can completely withdraw by August 31st. Evacuation efforts have been criticized for the chaotic and deadly scenes at airports. Evacuees are being flown across Europe and the Middle East uh, to Haven locations. You have folks in this country uh, like uh, white supremacist Tucker Carlson who yell, kick and scream, don't let these people in America. Uh, and it's like, Tucker, it's not just your country. And now you talk about replacement theory. They're really mad because their numbers are shrinking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is something that we've been talking about literally for years on this show, right, about how the demographics of this nation is shifting, how, how it will, you know, the, the clock is ticking in terms of how much longer this will, in fact, be a majority white nation. And what you've been seeing all, all across this nation politi politically and just in terms of the rise in hate groups and everything else that we've seen over the past several years is all connected to that. It is this understanding that representation is waning with regards to the white population. And it's this desire to do whatever they can to either slow that process down on the one hand, and on the second hand, change the rules of the game so that majority no longer uh, controls in the same way that we do in a normal democracy, right? Like if you know that you're no longer being in, going to be in the majority, but you still want to hold on to power, what do you do? Uh, you undermine democracy. So we see both of those things happening at the same time by the ilk of a Tucker Carlson, of a Donald Trump, of all of their like crazy wacko followers who are very organized and I would argue very evil in a lot of these efforts all the way down to everything that's happening at the state level to mm -hmm. undermine our voting rights. It is all connected. And so when I look at what you have people like Tucker saying right now about uh, Afghanistan and refugees, it is definitely right in place with that same songbook that they were seeing under the Trump administration, because the last thing they want to do is to do anything that would uh, that would result in more people of color coming to this nation, which would even more greatly accelerate the day in which this is no longer a majority white nation. Um, folks, got to go to a break. We come back. Fit, live, win. Hmm, lifting weights in order to lose weight. Does that make sense? Hmm, I guess says so. That's next on Roland Martin Unfiltered, broadcasting live from Los Angeles. Back in a moment. Floyd's death hopefully put another nail in the car for the racism. You talk about awakening America, it led to a historic summer of, of protest. 
I hope our younger generation don't ever forget that nonviolence is soul force. Sorry for the Folks, uh, you're trying to lose weight. How crucial is it for you to actually use weightlifting to do so? Uh, Dooley is the founder of Effect Fitness. He joins me right now on Roller Martin Unfiltered. Glad to have you back on the show, Dooley. So well, thank you. explain thank you. Thank you. this for those, who, for those who don't know. How does weightlifting, how does that help lose weight? Anytime you can build some muscle rolling, that increases that metabolism and that helps keep that fat away. So the more muscle you build now, the more weight you lift now, the better chance you have of keeping that fat away. So that is a proven fact, scientifically proven. And so, obviously, uh, uh, we, we talk about um, your 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 uh, diet. That's critically important. So, and we're talking about. How much weight? Because there are people who say, oh, my goodness, you're not lifting enough. And so is it a matter of uh, what, um, you know, uh, dumbbells, resistance bands? So what are we talking about uh, that folks should be doing as a part of this? Any, any, any type of, like you say, every, everybody's going to be different, just like that diet. And I tell people this all the time. I don't want you to do a diet just because Roland did it or just because Dooley did it. You need to do a diet that's going to be specifically tailored to you. And the thing that we can always go back to is dieting for your blood type. So when you start eating for your blood type and dieting for your blood type, that right there is, like I said, that's the science. That's the proven fact of, okay, I got an O positive, so I know I can digest meat. Or I'm AB or I'm A positive. I know I can stay away from certain type of meats. So in terms of the diet part, you need to make sure that you're eating for your blood type, bro. Okay, so, so, so you have that. All right, so somebody who's watching, they're saying, look, man, I, I can't afford a gym membership. COVID is going on. Okay. I can't afford a whole bunch of weights uh, in my house. So what should they be using uh, if they don't have a lot of resources or they don't have enough space for yeah. traditional weights? And they, that's the same thing. Go back to that body weight exercise. So you, you, anybody, like I said, you can fight. You got a couch. You got a bed. You can, from the push-ups to the sit-ups to the calisthenics. Anytime that you can just get that body moving with those push-ups, those sit-ups, and some burpees, like I said, you don't need gyms, gonna, that, that weight lifting equipment stuff, that's obsolete almost, man. So if you can just get that body moving, use your body weight and some resistance training, you'll be just fine. Avis, got a question for Dooley? Absolutely. So, you know, I think that with, uh, with, with weight training, because, you know, I, I am a fan of weight training, I get it. Oftentimes, women are concerned that they're going to end up looking bulky, like that they're going to end up looking <laughs> I love like, this. You know, I love a, this. A, a female version of the Incredible Hulk. You know, like, <laughs> what can you tell women so, I, I uh, love about that. the importance of I weight training so that they get a sleek physique? Yeah, I, I get that a lot, because the one thing you don't want as a woman, you think about... As we get older, how our body starts to tip forward and we have that hump in our back. The more muscle you can build now, the better chance you got to stand upright. And that's how you want to look at, like, weightlifting. The more muscle you build now, the less chance you have to be, like, the hunchback of Notre Dame, in a sense. Like, I, you want to be upright. And the more weight that you lift, the stronger you get, the more muscle you build, the better chance you have to stand upright. And I tell people that all the time. Build as much muscle as you possibly can while the body still is building it. Because eventually, you won't even be able to build the muscle no more. Uh oh! What 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 do you? All okay, right then. I've never heard that. Can I ask really a quick follow up? And, 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 well, and no, because because you can, because because when you reach a certain age, you stop being able to build muscle. It. Absolutely. Oh my Absolutely. god, that scares me. How old is I'm that? Telling you. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> you better be you get to your fifties. My man, how much time? I'm telling you. <laughs> Look, if, if if you ain't got the muscles by a certain age, your ass ain't gonna get them. You ain't getting them. You're not getting them. Oh That's a fact, Roland. That is a fact. So this is a different biological uh, clock. As simple as that, Dooley. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that's another biological clock. Absolutely. Dooley, where, tell people where they can reach you. They can find me at, at Effect Fitness on Instagram, at Effect Fitness on Facebook. Follow us. 
All right, then. Duly, I still appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Avis, thank you so very thank much you, uh, for joining us uh, as well uh, on today's show. Folks, got to go to break. We come back. We will talk about uh, a new book out that deals with the absolute insanity of Don the last year of Donald Trump's presidency. Folks, unbelievable craziness that took place with that fool in the White House. Uh, you will hear from two Washington Post reporters who broke it all down in a fascinating book uh, that, that is a page turner that I'm reading as we speak. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Back in a moment. Films ain't just about hurting black folk. Right. We got to deal with it. It's injustice. It's wrong. I do feel like in this generation, we've got to do more around being intentional and resolving conflict. You and process. I have always agreed. Yeah. But we agree on the big piece. Yeah. Our conflict is not about destruction. Conflict's going to happen. wild and crazy the last year of Donald Trump's presidency was, but folks, uh, it was even nuttier than you think. Uh, Philip Rucker and Carol Leone have break it all down uh, in their book, I Alone Can Fix It, Donald J. J. Trump's catastrophic final year. I had an opportunity to sit with both of them to talk about uh, the craziness that took place in the, in the roller coaster this country went on in 2020. Here's our conversation. All right, let's get right into it. Uh, Carol and Philip, uh, I, I got to tell you, uh, reading I Long Can Fix It uh, what was, was uh, I'm sitting there as somebody who lived through it, who was there in Cleveland when he gave that speech, when he gave that line. And I'm reading this book and I'm going, I knew it was nuts, but this is really crazy. What this nation went through over the last four years with Donald Trump sitting in the Oval Office. You said a mouthful there, Roland. I'm not sure your question, but that's exactly how Phil and I felt reporting this book. You know, we were covering it in real time too. We were thinking we were doing a pretty decent job of writing about this for the Washington Post and for the public in 2020. But it turned out when we did the deeper excavation, it was so much more crazy, dangerous and and sort of spine chilling, um, bone chilling to walk through it again with some of the people that had been pretty silent about how frightened they were about Donald Trump's impulses, his idea of governing and and his quest to maintain his grip on power. You know, human lives really be damned. You know, Philip, I, I just it, it was just Again, just even just reading the first 100 pages, it was just one after another. And, and when I think back to just the first month of the presidency, I remember everybody was going, is this what it's going to be like for the next four years? And the answer was yes. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, we all experienced as Americans following the news and covering the news, the chaos, right? The daily and hourly news cycles of one crisis after another, after another, after another. And what Carol and I tried to do with this book, just as we did with our first book, A Very Stable Genius, is kind of hit pause and go back and take readers behind the scenes and let people really see what was going on in, in real time and in real life. Uh, it's so much more dangerous and chaotic and harrowing than we could see in public at the time. Uh, but when you sit down with those officials and, and really recount for the benefit of history, what was going on, what the president was saying, what ideas he was proposing, uh, what almost happened that didn't happen because some, some servant, you know, public servant stood in the way, uh, you start to realize that this country really was on the brink of, of, of changing, of our democracy falling. And the thing that really, I think that really jumps out, I mean, y'all detail uh, in, you know, really the, the, the beginning uh, of the book, this, 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 this the, obviously uh, the pandemic, uh, COVID-19. And if he had probably done a decent job, re-election would have been uh, easy. 
I mean, that. And so, so even with all the other stuff, all the other reporting, all the other things that went beyond, besides the pandemic, uh, his base was so solid. The Republicans were so solid behind him. Folks would have been perfectly fine uh, with him getting another four years. I think that couldn't be truer. I, I think that's exactly what was uh, sort of fated to happen, was for him to have a second term. He was, the economy was doing great. He was chugging along. Even if the economy took a hit from the pandemic, he was viewed as the defender for such a large portion of America, and Republicans were in lockstep with him. But exactly what you said, Roland, is what the attorney general, who we all thought was completely beholden and loyal to Donald Trump. It's exactly what Bill Barr said to the president in a very sort of prescient warning in the spring of 2020. He said this chaos surrounding COVID, people are scared. They actually know some people who are sick and they're watching these news conferences where you give these ideas of bleach injection or you fight with your aides about whether or not masks should happen. This chaotic way you're dealing with COVID is going to cost you the election. He said he had a foreshadowing, as he told Trump, that he was going to lose just the way George H.W. Bush lost in 92 when Barr was his attorney general. And it, he couldn't have been more right. It, it did center so much on the fear around COVID and whether or not the president really knew how to handle uh, or had the toolkit for a, a crisis. Uh, Philip, um, uh, Peter Russo, uh, Peter, Peter Russell, uh, was a deputy press secretary for President George, uh, Vice President George H.W. Bush. And uh, Peter uh, was uh, one of my professors at Texas A&M University. And one of the things that he said to me was, he said, Roland, the interesting thing is that the thing that people most like about you, meaning he was speaking of anybody, is the same thing people don't like. And uh, folks, uh, people who supported Donald Trump, uh, black male voters, others, oh, Trump is going to do what he says and mean what he says, and uh, he doesn't give an inch. And, and, and both of you write when Anthony Fauci said that is a failing, let's admit it, Failing was not a word Trump was going to let stand. He, he was somebody who was so hell bent on, I'm not going to give an inch. I'm not going to admit failure. I'm not going to say we screwed up. I'm not going to apologize. Even when this man flirted with death uh, with COVID, it was still, I'm going to play tough, take my mask off. When he was up there clearly laboring, uh, you know, with, with his breath. And that was the thing that really just jumped out. He could not in any circumstance show any level of compassion or concern for what was happening to the rest of Americans. And that's what caused the election. That's what caused people to say, you know what, this guy's got to go. Yeah, I think you're onto something there, Roland. And that's a smart point about Trump's sort of inability and, and refusal, really, to admit failure of any kind in, in, in any circumstance. And I think what's at the heart of it is that he viewed governing as a public relations campaign. Governing was a branding exercise for Trump. He's been a salesman his whole life, whether he's selling real estate or reality television programs or his own political uh, campaign. And when he became president, that that toolkit, that that kind of salesman's uh, toolkit of, of bragging and bluster and bullying uh, just didn't work when he faced a real crisis in the coronavirus. I mean, lives were at stake and his inability to manage that crisis and also his inability to tell the truth to the American people, to level with folks about the severity of the threat and to show any sort of compassion or empathy for those who were lo losing their lives. Uh, taken together, it had deadly consequences uh, for the country. And I think you're absolutely right. That's the reason why, uh, in the end, he lost re-election and was denied that second term. Carol, you have covered Washington, D.C. You understand power. You understand politics. You understand what happens when you lo no longer have power. Were, were, were the, in your reporting, were, were, were the two of you even shocked at how Republican Party leaders up and down simply did not have a moral compass, did not have, now these are my words, obviously, a moral compass, principle or values, who said, you know what, doesn't matter, He's, he says he's Republican, we're going to go along with it. I think about that New New York New York uh, piece, uh, New York New Yorker magazine piece uh, of James Baker in September, uh, and where his whole deal is: I'm a Republican, and so hey, yeah, these things bother me, but I'm going to support. That's who's in power. 
They didn't care. They just they just didn't care. It was a hey, he was a means to an end. He was a means to being in control. Well, you're you're absolutely right about two pieces there that are so fascinating. I mean, it's not the job of a reporter like myself or Phil to talk about people's moral compasses, but I'll say this on those two points you you sound out. One, in many ways, Donald Trump kind of blew through the guardrails, blew through the norms of Washington. Law didn't matter. Politeness didn't matter. Partisanship um, that was nitty gritty and dirty didn't matter. You know, the, the, the basic like benefit of the country, you're, when you're governing, when you're a servant in the people's house, you're supposed to care about what happens to the people. That didn't matter either. And what Republicans in the legislature learned was, you know what, Donald Trump didn't pay any price for behaving that way. In fact, all he did was gain more steam and gain more power. You're right about COVID, right? That took him off the rails because people were frightened. And it looked so insane every day on that newsstand where he was giving the press conferences and none of it made sense. But Republicans learned a lesson just as Donald Trump was learning a lesson. There wasn't a political cost to behaving the way he did, to breaking the law, as prosecutors found in the Mueller probe, because he, he wasn't indicted, he wasn't charged, he couldn't be as a sitting president. And they learned that his vote base was loyal. His, lo his voter base was there for him, whether he enacted the policies he promised, whether he told the truth or not, whether he did anything of value for them. As long as he was on a soapbox saying he defended them and he cared about them and he cared about the America they believed in, whatever amorphous thing that was, those voters were with him. So that's a powerful lesson if you're trying to keep your job as a Republican in Congress, because you know you don't have to pay a price for how you behave and you need the votes that Donald Trump, even after the presidency, still controls, still shepherds. And Philo, I think we saw that when Donald Trump attacked Senator John McCain uh, about being a prisoner of war. Uh, and, and again, conventional wisdom, oh my God, how dare you? All the people who so-called love veterans and love the flag and uh, uh, revered Senator John McCain, people said, ah, whatever the hell, that's all fine. And that to me, and, and in real time, I was warning people, folks, if he's a get, get away with that, oh, you can you you can forget about any other norms. And I think it was it was this constant deal uh, in the media. Uh, okay, have we reached bottom? There, I don't think there was ever a bottom with a Donald Trump presidency. I don't think we. That, I don't think that, that even now, even with all the claims of of him saying all oh, uh, election was stolen, there is no bottom when someone doesn't care. They don't care. Yeah, I think that's right. I think Trump has proven over these years that at least when it comes to him in politics, there is no bottom. Um, and I'm glad you brought up that McCain example. I was there in 2015 in Iowa at the family leader event where Trump made those comments about McCain. And I remember watching it and looking at the other reporters who were sitting around the table with me. And we all thought, oh, boy, he really stepped in it. This is going to be the end uh, for Trump's nascent uh, presidential campaign. And sure enough, he didn't lose a single voter over it. And it was a remarkable um, show of his kind of Teflon quality within the Republican Party. And it just speaks to the fact that so many of his voters were making moral calculations. They decided to look past his transgressions, look past the nasty, petty attacks, look past the Access Hollywood video, grab, grab women by the you-know-what, all because they thought he was fighting for him and because they thought they'd benefit from some of his policies, like his tax cuts. They could you know, somehow get rich or the rich people could stay rich because of it. And they made these sacrifices, these, these kind of character, um, character trades, if it were, and that's what that's how he ended up getting elected. And I think that's how he thought he was going to get reelected. And it's how he thinks today uh, he might get back into the White House when he runs in 2024, which he uh, seems to be intending to do. Carol, a lot of a lot of media people um, really got caught up in the economic anxiety uh, storyline. 
I was one of the people who was saying, y'all, this thing is white fear. I'm actually, my book comes out in, uh, in the first quarter next year, because in 2009, that was a poll that, uh, and they asked, are you optimistic about the future of America? Uh, and every group uh, except white Americans uh, majority said yes. September 2016, question was asked, are you optimistic about the future of America economically for the next 10 years? Every group uh, except white Americans, a majority. And, and when you listen to uh, Trump supporters and Republican supporters, uh, and then you saw the actions and then you heard what they were saying, even now when you look at this whole brouhaha over critical race theory, which frankly, no one even really knows about. So it's not, it's not even that, that big of a deal. I think what Donald Trump did was bring together all of these political forces that we have witnessed over the last 40, 50 years, the Southern strategy, uh, this whole uh, angst, Midwest, white worker, white working class, oh, they forgot about you. Oh, it was before it was the blacks in the 80s. Now it's the illegal immigrants. That was his whole deal with Trump. And, and so we're sort of now sitting in this space where we are moving towards becoming a nation, majority of people of color. And what he, where, where he and the Republican Party sit is really at a place of, are they going to be the party, frankly, of white America or a diverse America? Just your thoughts and your reporting and look, and look at these last four years uh, about that thesis. I think it's a really smart point to hit on. Now, I, I, I'm wary of one thing. Donald Trump's supporters can't be summarized as one monolithic element. But right. what we can, but but I like the two pieces you're describing. For example, uh, we have found in our reporting that there is an overwhelming number of white America, especially white male America and white working class America that feels looked down upon, feels left behind. The economic winds are not blowing their way. They're, they may be the first uh, generation in their communities to see their children do less well than they did. And that is causing quite a bit of angst and anger, fear and anger. And what Donald Trump was able to do, as I remember, you know, Don McGahn, White House counsel, he went to see Donald Trump campaign. And in our last book, we report about how electrifying he found Donald Trump on this on the stump. He didn't think this mogul guy from New York, this real estate developer was going to have any appeal to working class white Americans, but he had an amazing connection with them. But here's the other un unpleasant part of that connection. While he taps into their anger and their fear about how America is changing, which really means how they're not doing as well as they once were or how they expected to do, he amps up the volume on their fear and their anger. Over the four years of his presidency, we heard him say things along, and especially in 2020, you know, you think you're safe and well, Joe Biden's going to bring Antifa to your suburbs and your communities. You know, what else is that code for? That is code for their, mm -hmm. you know, that, that is just strictly code for, you know, your white communities are going to be overrun by people of color and dangerous people, violent people. When he was campaigning in, in 2016 and when he was pushing his border wall in 2017, what was he amping up in terms of fear and anger? He was talking about Mexicans being rapists and killers that were coming streaming across the borders. Again, amping up that fear and anger, not trying to tap into it and address it, but just increase it so that he could use it for his own political gain. Now there's another, again, in the non-monolithic piece, there are rich people who believe they're going to get richer by Donald Trump's presidency. And that no doubt benefited him throughout the, the 26 campaign, 16 campaign. And he believed it would carry him a great deal in 2020. But unfortunately, there were a lot of people worried um, about whether or not he was going to be able to save them from a crisis and not sure, in fact, quite convinced otherwise that he wouldn't. Philip, on the point that Carol just made there, uh, I, I would often say that uh, you had these three forces that were actually moving uh, uh, down the same path. You had your national security uh, Republicans who believed in the military industrial complex. Oh, he's just going to just throw billions at the military. Cool. I'm down with it. Then you had the Grover Norquist Republicans who are all about taxes. Hey, fine. This guy's going to cut taxes. Doesn't matter what else he says. We're good. And then, of course, you had uh, uh, your, your white working class voters 
or who in their minds, hey, this guy's going to fight for us, even though when you look at his trade war against China, it screwed dairy farmers. It screwed folks, uh, the soybean farmers, uh, a lot of those same people. And I remember, remember seeing this interview where there were a couple of them who filed for bankruptcy, lost their businesses, and they said, I will still vote for Donald Trump again. And I'm sitting there going, what in the hell uh, are these people thinking uh, where they actually lost their family farm and their business and they still say, I'm going to vote for this guy? And, and, and it was just this. It, I never, Rudy Giuliani, I remember he said, Trump is our last hope. And I obviously being black, we look at that whole thing a whole different way than some other different people. And I think that we, as those of us in media, have to have to force ourselves to get out of the conventional political world and realize that when folks uh, they're going after uh, their hearts when they're taught, when they're pushing those buttons, those angst buttons that we have to factor in race, we got to factor in class, we got to factor in all these different things, and when in a Trump comes along and goes, hey, I'm just going to blow through it all. And it creates this whirlwind and people are left to figure out, okay, what's going on here? And I'm sitting here going, it's actually right in front of us if we pay attention to political history and how other candidates used it to their their advantage to gain political wins. I think that's right. I mean, you're you're right to point out the racial elements here. You can't separate politics from Uh, all of those other factors. And certainly Trump was a master at, you know, the dog whistle, which was, you know, really more of a bullhorn. I mean, he he made no bones about what he was trying to communicate and to whom. The one thing we should keep in mind, though, is that the people receptive to that message did not make up a majority of this country. In fact, even when he won in 2016, he won uh, with three million fewer popular votes than Hillary Clinton, uh, and he did not have anywhere near the majority of, of the votes that were cast in 2016. Uh, and then, of course, in 2020, uh, he finished even worse uh, vis-a-vis Joe Biden. So, you know, that is not the majority view in this country, um, but it certainly is a, a large part of this country, and Trump was very effective at mobilizing those voters through these sort of coded uh, racial messages. Uh, are the both of you still? Are both, are both of you shocked that even after your book is out, even after these four years, uh, that that when you see folks like Senator Ron Johnson uh, really holding on to the big lie and these other candidates and they're changing laws, uh, and, and 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 you're sitting here going, and I think Carol, it probably goes to what you said earlier. Hey, there's no price to pay. He basically crossed the line. Everybody is cool, so what the hell? Let's join them. But are the both of you surprised at what you're seeing that he continues to dominate the party even though he lost? There's nobody bigger than him right now, Roland, in the Republican Party. He's the standard bearer. If he if the primary was this week, he would be the Republican nominee for president. He's got that kind of power over voters who still view him almost as a demigod. I mean, let's keep in mind, thousands of them committed a felony at, at, at almost at his request on January 6th, barged, right. barged past police broke into a federal building where there are no trespassing rules, carried weapons as they went. Uh, You know, this is not what you're expecting from working class white Americans to start. uh, And obviously the DC wasn't prepared for this. They had this construct that they weren't expecting these folks to start beating up on police, but they did. And that's a lot of power. Again, I've read some of the white supremacist chat room conversations people had before January 6th. They were talking about dying for their flag and dying for Donald Trump. I don't know how much more powerful a bond there is. You asked if we're shocked. I feel surprised and I don't because he had a connection. He made them more more upset and more angry, more fearful. And that hold is going to be hard to break. The only way it's going to be broken is if the leaders of the Republican Party who represent some of these red states start speaking the truth about what actually happened, what happened Mm -hmm. on January 6th, what happened in the election. Uh, Stop stop whispering it to Donald Trump and start telling it to voters. Philip? I think that's right. I mean, the only thing that surprises me, frankly, is that it took until January 6th of 2021 for one of Donald Trump's political events to turn violent and deadly. 
um, you know, we were at a lot of those campaign rallies over the years and, and it, it felt like kindling there. I mean, it just, it, it felt like at any moment those crowds could erupt in anger uh, and, and turn their violence on either the media uh, or other people in their communities. And, and you know, fortunately that didn't happen uh, very often. I'm just surprised it took until January 6th. Uh, I know this may the next question. I ask all, all authors this question when they work on books. Uh, and I'm sure y'all probably have more than one. And if you got two or three, that's fine. Uh, what was the wow moment for you in writing this? What was that uh, one piece of research or comment or quote that caused you to literally stop writing and go, <laughs> wow? <laughs> there were a lot. There were quite a few, Roland. I'm just going to try to keep it to two because Phil sure. probably has quite a few as well. Um, I remember when we were learning that in a meeting, um, Mark Milley was furious because Stephen Miller was telling the president in June that Black Lives Matter protesters were burning the country down. This is, again, right after George Floyd's death, after some protests outside Washington in that weekend, the, the tension is building and Stephen Miller is explaining the, the country's burning down. These protesters are burning it down. And the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff turned around with all of his shoulder and his and his arm and said, you shut the F up, Stephen. You don't know what you're talking about. That's a pretty big thing to say in the Oval <laughs> Office. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, the other thing that really surprised me and and I ha had to fight to keep my jaw up was when the president said he had no regrets. Forgive me. When Donald Trump, the former president, told Phil and me in our interview in Mar-a-Lago that he had no regrets, no regrets at all, except for one, that he wished he had unleashed active duty military. He wished he had overcome the objections of his attorney general, his secretary of defense, his chairman of joint chief staff, who were constantly stopping this. And he wished he had sicked active duty military troops on Black Lives Matter protesters. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 a wow. Philip. You know, I'll, I'll just add one because Carol hit a couple of them there. Um, and I obviously agree with what she said and she speaks for both of us. But, uh, you know, one other that surprised us both was that uh, was to learn that in the, the weeks after the November 3rd election, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, who's the highest ranking military officer in this country, a, a career public servant, a student of history, that he not only heard in Donald Trump's rhetoric parallels to Adolf Hitler uh, rising in power in, in Germany in the 1930s, but also feared that Trump would actually use the military, would issue an order as the commander in chief to try to execute a coup in order to stay in power despite having lost the election. That's how dangerous uh, Trump was in the minds of the leaders of the military. And that's how close the country's democracy came to falling. Uh, it is uh, it is an absolute um, uh, fascinating uh, and intriguing read uh, to uh, to go through this. Uh, it uh, I think I read uh, the first 100 pages uh, probably within a few hours on one night, and it was and I'm just sitting there just shaking my head, going, "By God, what in the world would have happened if we had to deal with another four years of this mayhem?" Uh, it is I, I alone can fix it. Uh, and I think the subhead is, is is apropos Donald J. Trump's catastrophic uh, final year. Uh, Carol, Philip, I certainly appreciate it. Uh, great job uh, with this book. Uh, and uh, folks, uh, definitely check it out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roland. Thank you, Roland. All right, folks, that is it for Roland Martin Unfiltered, live from Los Angeles. Uh, we're shooting a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews. We've had some great discussions so far. Richard Lawson, uh, Glenn Turman, also Mario Van Peebles, Michael Collier, Bill Duke. And so I uh, can't wait for you all to see what we produced uh, after we leave here. And so that's it for us. Don't forget to support us in what we do by joining our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar you give goes to support uh, the show. So please, cash out, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered, paypal.me forward slash rmartinunfiltered. 
Unfiltered. Venmo.com forward slash RM Unfiltered. And Zell is rolling at RolandSMartin.com. Rolling at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Don't forget to also, folks, uh, follow us on YouTube. We're close to have 800,000 subscribers on our YouTube channel. So please follow us and click that button. So when we go live, uh, you'll know it as well. All right, folks, that's it. I'll see you tomorrow right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Ha!